Thank you very much. Thank you, Shane. Um, I'm astonished to see this crowd here, but I had really no idea what to expect. Um, I've enjoyed walking through downtown Montgomery. I've really never been here before. Um, but it was, it's a pleasure to be here and at this magnificent building. Uh, and um, we will explore the makers of the Sacred Harp. And what you see there is one of three currently active editions of the Sacred Harp that, are, that people sing from. So the Sacred Harp, um, I see many people I know to be singers and enthusiasts already, and others maybe beginners. And again, I didn't know what to expect, but I thought we should have a little bit of background, and some things may surprise you, some things you, I'm sure, already know. But the Sacred Harp primarily is the title of a songbook first published in 1844. This is a 1991 edition we see here. <clears throat> the Sacred Harp is also uh, a tradition, which I would call a, a non-denominational community musical event that emphasizes participation and not performance. And the distinguishing things about it, which you can see if you, for, for yourself if you attend a singing, is that the singers face inward in a hollow square and that they rotate leaders so that everyone is invited to take a turn leading, that is calling out a, a number of a song and then beating that uh, time with the hand. It's a very simple up and down motion. The notes are printed in four different shapes that tell um, singers which uh, syllable to sing when they run through for practice before using the words. Now, uh, I would say that sacred harp singing and other shape note traditions are perhaps more prevalent in Alabama than anywhere else. Yet, I have met in this state many people who have told me as a fact that sacred harp singers never sing the words. They only sing syllables. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, hard to believe where they got that idea, but that's certainly something distinctive. Today, uh, people sing from the sacred harp in almost all uh, states of the Union and the District of Columbia, in Canada, Ireland, the United Kingdom, and Australia, but even in Germany and Poland. Uh, and yet, many of our local singings throughout the state are being discontinued. Some more are discontinued every year, as there are fewer people in the, in the uh, you could say, the country communities which have supported it over the years. Uh, you can have singers on campuses all over the world singing from the Sacred Harp, but the culture, the rural culture that has nourished it all these years is, is uh, declining. Um, today, in fact, Sacred Harp singing is considered old-fashioned. Uh, the um, great song leader Hugh McGraw called, it was, it was always tried to counteract the idea that it was old fogey music. And um, we often think of sacred harp singing as one of the oldest traditions in the state. And um, here is one of the makers of the sacred harp. This, this is B.F. White and his wife Thurza. And they were, um, they made this tintype in old age. But uh, when he compiled the Sacred Harp in, 19, in 1844, he was a struggling Georgia farmer, aged 43, um, who got most of his financial support from an, um, a 21-year-old uh, wealthy um, member of a planter family uh, nearby. And so these were relatively young people, and they published a brand new, innovative songbook 
that had many new kinds of songs, and every edition has had new music by new composers. It is not an old fogey tradition. Um, so, we, you heard sacred harp music when you were coming into this auditorium, and you know basically what it sounds like. But So I thought today we would start with some more unusual sounds, which are, if sacred harp is new, then what was old, what was old music at that time? And um, before the sacred harp, there was lined out psalmody. And like so many things in culture, um, it, it also survives. You can hear it in some places. This is a style of singing um, that we know exactly when it started, 1643. And the idea was that people would sing tunes, sing the psalms in Protestant churches throughout the English-speaking world. And uh, the Westminster Assembly of Divines, which uh, met in Westminster to uh, sort of take over the Church of England along Puritan lines, um, wanted everybody to sing psalms and said they would, uh, should use a word book, a, a book that has words, but that if people can't read, you have to spoon feed the words line by line to them uh, in, in some kind of uh, prompting that um, some fit person, the minister or some other fit person uh, do read the psalm line by line before the singing thereof. So this is a kind of call and response, um, which quickly developed into a f an oral tradition, into a folk tradition where the melodies were drawn out. And um, here we can... A, a psalm tune as sung today on the Isle of Lewis off the coast of Scotland. And uh, they're, they're singing the psalms in the Gaelic language. But that doesn't mean that this, this tradition comes from Scotland. It just took refuge there. Oh, uh oh. Now I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I wanted to. Well, I'm having a little problem here. There we go. Now. This may sound familiar to you if you're familiar with other line and hymn traditions. hear that it's sung very slowly, that there's vocal embellishment, that not everybody is singing exactly together, and um, that the leader is feeding the words to the congregation in a kind of a chanting voice. 
Um, and very quickly, as this, as this developed and got more elaborate, the, um, it was criticized for being uh, rustic and uneducated, even though they sang it just like this in the cities. The English settlers that came to America all sang in pretty much this way. Um, and by 1700, people were criticizing... Um. Uh, criticizing this sound, although they realized that many of the people loved it. It had developed into a beloved uh, folk style. Um, but uh, one preacher about 1725 um, was saying that most of the psalm tunes sung in the usual way are more like song tunes because you have so many extra notes. And that uh, somebody had found a tune that had 30 notes when it was printed, but they sang it with about 150 notes. Um, and basically, he was talking about what he calls the usual way. And the usual way of singing is line tinnity. The new way that this preacher and many others were promoting at that time is the ancestor of sacred harp singing. It is called the regular way which means singing by rule instead of by custom. And so in other words, sing the notes as written and sing the um, tempo as written, sing as, as um, follow the length of the notes and maybe even sing in harmony. Um, but this is just a, a, a way, this is a, a recording from Eastern Kentucky um, that Alan Lomax made uh, in a regular bat, old regular Baptist church. And here we can test, listen to the melody, and see you could probably count about 150 notes in the first verse. As, and, and this tune is not, this is not the tune we're looking at here, that's Canterbury. But it, ha it has about 30 notes. probably hear music in this style at any of at least a dozen churches here in Montgomery. Now, you probably wouldn't go to the regular preaching service, but if you came there very early on Sunday morning, or maybe at a Wednesday devotion, you could hear lined out singing. It is most um, prominent among African Americans, and um, this is a this was actually a men's club founded in Boston in 1693 by indentured servants and slaves. Cotton Mather, the famous uh, Puritan uh, divine, was the chaplain. Every meeting began with a prayer and the singing of a psalm. And that psalm was most likely lined out because this is the way psalms were sung and also because not every member could read. And they were, everybody was supposed to sing. Um, this is um, Dr. Isaac Watts. And you, uh, if you're not familiar with psalm singing, I mean, 
you can chant the Psalms, and uh, Catholic monks do it, uh, Episcopalians chant Psalms, and they're singing prose. They're not singing poetry, they're singing prose. But um, the way the Puritans preferred was to turn those Psalms into poetry in, in verses, so that you could use the same tune over and over again and sing. And uh, Isaac Watts, his Psalms of David, interpreted in the language of the New Testament, and his hymns and spiritual songs, usually printed in one book, was the most popular book in colonial America, um, by far more printings and more copies than any other book, because everybody had a copy to, that they carried to the meeting house. Um, so here's just to show you what a psalm looks like in the Bible, and then what it looks like with Isaac Watts. And you see it's turned into poetry from this, they may be, it may be poetry in Hebrew, but when you translate it directly into English, it doesn't have enough of a format and structure to sing it in, in verses. So, um, I love the Lord here. And this is by far the most um, common and most popular uh, today among African Americans, especially Baptists, who um, pretty much all who know this tune, uh, which Terry Miller recorded in 1987 in Marshall County, Mississippi, right near where I live, but it should be a very familiar sound to many of you. See, there are, in this case, far more than 150 notes in each verse. We only got about halfway through. Um, it would take a considerable amount of time to sing through an entire psalm with several verses, um, if, if you were to do that. And this just shows, this is a, a field recording made by Frederick Ramsey in 1954 of, um, to show how the old way of singing, or what they called the usual way, has survived and influenced even solo singing of various kinds. And here is a, this is page 47 at the bottom in the Sacred Heart. There is no lining out, just a solo song.
can hear echoes of this tradition of singing in many uh, popular singers, such as Aretha Franklin, who grew up with this tradition in her church in Memphis, um, as well as uh, Mariah Carey, uh, Christina Aguilera, and many others. This, um, But now, in South Georgia, there's something that comes even a little closer to the Sacred Harp, where they sing lined out hymnody with harmony, both uh, white and African American. Um, Bernice Reagan Johnson, the founder of the group called Sweet Honey in the Rock, has brought several of those arrangements into, uh, into use of the kind of singing she grew up with in South Georgia. And the Lee family of Hoboken, Georgia, are singing here the way they sing in church, only they're not willing to line out because to them this is a recording and not not worship. So they leave out the lining out. But if you hear the harmony, it's quite astonishing. We camp meeting around just shortly after 1800 um, and it shows shows you the camp meeting as an environment where many of the songs in the sacred harp arose um, and they were sung in these enthusiastic religious gatherings um, which were in a sense almost um, at least temporarily uh, uh, some of the rules that govern society were relaxed because of religious fervor. For example, uh, women played a very strong role as exhorters and sometimes even as preachers. And um, black and white um, both participated. This was uh, an integrated um, revivals uh, temporarily. Later on when they became institutionalized, th those things stopped. But the uh, American spiritual, which appears in the Sacred Harp and many other books in the 1840s, uh, has a very close relationship to the Negro spirituals that were collected during and after the Civil War um, from freedmen and became turned into a, uh, a concert experience by the Fisk Jubilee singers and others. So, um, and this shows, by the way, you can see the, uh, the tents, uh, the, the stage and the wattled fences, and then in the center you see there's something marked with an A. This is a boarded enclosure filled with straw in which the converts were thrown that they might kick about without injuring themselves. <laughs> And in this high-pressure environment, some of the some people sang uh, religious texts, melodies from the stage, the dance hall, or the military parade ground, and others made up repetitive text repeated with minor changes. Um, here is uh, the sound of also from 
1987, just a congregational, traditional, spiritual that most people know, glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burden down. Glory, glory, hallelujah. This is from a quartet rehearsal. is um, a piece from the Sacred Harp um, sung, um, sung in Mississippi, I'll just to hear a little bit of this, um, that has the refrain. <laughs> That song is in the Sacred Harp, and it's um, credited to E.J. King, who was that young man who helped B.F. White publish the Sacred Harp. Um, and he was, as I said, a young man on a very large plantation uh, in the center of the um, part of Georgia that was full of very large and prosperous farms that were worked by enslaved African Americans. Um, it, it is likely that when we say the makers of the Sacred Harp, we include some of those African Americans who worked on these farms uh, that, that the composer's name we see uh, were the big farmers like uh, Leonard Breedlove and E.J. King and J.L. Pickard um, this was not Appalachian, this was not Celtic, this was not, um, uh, you could say, um, upland south music. This was from the, the center of what in Alabama we would call the Black Belt. Um, later on, after the Civil War, those areas quit singing Sacred Harp, and so you hear it more in the northern areas of, of Alabama and Georgia. Um, but I think that we should mention that that is an important influence on, on the songs of the Sacred Harp, which has more of those spiritual format, those songs with refrains, than any other book of its time. Um, now, as we move to Alabama, and as we now move to Sacred Harp selections so that, that we have time to play, um, unlike Georgia, which was uh, sort of settled by uh, white from the east to the west. Alabama started from the southwest from Mobile and then this shows the that big central area which was the major creek session of 1814 that includes where we are standing now. Um, but uh, the first part of Alabama to really show the influence of sacred harp singing was that yellow area to the right. That was, uh, it, that land was still in the hands of the Creek Nation until 1830. And almost immediately after that, gold was discovered. And there was a gold rush in the 1830s in that part of Alabama. Um, so that part of Alabama 
and then later on those more north north and western northwestern areas where the sacred harp has flourished until today as well as the uh, southern tier of counties there um, so <clears throat> so uh, sacred harp singing and composing the makers of the sacred harp uh, move from the east to the west most of them were born in Georgia some of them were born in South or North Carolina moved to Georgia and then they moved to Alabama and sometimes moved further west to Mississippi and Texas um, William Lafayette Williams uh, lived near uh, was a, a, a physician who lived near Roanoke Alabama and in that yellow area um, the young couple that you see at the top of the other one is Tom and Amanda Denson. This apparently was taken at the, at the time of their wedding. She was 17, he was 15. And uh, both of them became credited composers and eventually, and they were living in Arbacuchi in eastern Alabama in the gold mines and eventually moved to Winston County in northwest Alabama. Um, the couple in front are her parents, um, who don't look too happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> so now we move further west and to Calvin Ford Letson. Again, came from Georgia, then moved to McCalla in Jefferson County, and then on to Tuscaloosa County, and eventually, uh, apparently also into Mississippi. But here he is with his family, he's sitting in the chair in the center, um, and is composed several songs in the Sacred Harp. We also had our recording stars, and... Uh, this is J.T. Allison's Sacred Harp Singers from Moody, Alabama. Um, and according to the research done by uh, Joyce Cawthon and John Beale, uh, these people were induced to go to Richmond, Indiana and record for Volcalion for a piano, which, which is also a piano company and record company. So, they're recording with a piano, uh, as in gospel music. I think what you're going to hear, though, this is they're singing a song which is in a minor key, and yet they are singing just like sacred harp singers, um, not necessarily the notes that are on the piano keyboard. And this song is in a minor key, and the piano is playing major chords, because gospel pianists don't know how to play in minor keys, generally. <laughs> so I find this a very intriguing sound. Sorry to stop it, I want to move on, uh, but I don't want you to think that they don't sing the words. <laughs> um, this is the uh, Phillips and the Green family members from uh, Blount County. And, but the, what we're going to hear, though, is um, the uh, Denson Quartet, three members, three brothers from the Denson family plus Cad Brown from Bibb County. And they, uh, he was a furniture dealer in Gadsden, so he probably helped them c connect with Columbia Records. And so this is recorded on Columbia without a piano and is 
one of the most beautiful recordings of Sacred Harp, sung by a small group. There are four singers, and it's including a male alto. Before I'm on my journey home, oh, come and go with me, oh, come and go with me, oh, come and go with me, for I'm on my journey home, oh, come and go with me, oh, come and go with me, oh, come and go with me, for I'm on my journey home. Oh, let's go back. Um, well, no, that was just a picture of a singing in um, Coleman Courthouse in 1943. But this is the sound. Uh, I'm gonna, we'll hear, finish off with a few recordings of some regional traditions and regional sounds. This is probably the most familiar, and this was in Jasper. This, um, I, the recording is from Winston County. But um, this was in Life magazine, and that little girl there is still singing. Um, very fast, northwest Alabama. If you have your sacred harp, and if it's the red book, it's on page 39, and the, and the blue book, it's page 400. But this is uh, a family group from Sand Mountain that I recorded um, in 82, and they're singing that song, which, uh, but with different words. They're singing the words of Amazing Grace, just to show that you can do that. You can interchange the words. So. Sing the words written down and then the amazing grace. All members of the nation. Wiregrass region from Ozark. Um, this is where African Americans actually started using the sacred harp after the Civil War, uh, along with the literacy in schools. Um, and this uh, group of singers became very quite famous. Um, and here they are. Um, and that's uh, Dewey P. Williams that you see there in the photograph. Uh, this was recorded by Hank Willett and Doris Dyan, I believe, around 1980.
Now, if you haven't, some of these are sounds you haven't heard, even if you've been to sacred harp singings. And unfortunately, that's a sound we can never hear again, because most of those singers have gone on. And this uh, same with this, well, this is singers in Mississippi who actually sing Do, Re, Mi. They sing seven syllables with the four, four shapes. recording is uh, a very rarely heard sound and again uh, I, I recorded this in 1980 or 81 and there in North Mississippi uh, these singers also sang with the do re mi syllables uh, the man you see leading there uh, was leading when he was hundred and three years old he died at the age of 106 um, and uh, a very remarkable style of singing that I'd like to play for you. This is page I would say the makers of the Sacred Harp include all the people that you can read about in that book and all the singers who have made, uh, made this tradition what it is. Um, this is the cover of that book. The cover is by Beth Ann Hill, an uh, Alabama artist. And what it shows is a particular event, I think 1883, which was a, a, a meeting of the Chattahoochee Convention in Mount Zion, Georgia. And at that uh, convention, there was a female song leader for the first time, and her name was Sidney Burdett Denson, a young school teacher. And it was reported in the paper, that it was such a sensation that there were people gawking in the windows. And, um, <laughs> And so it shows a traditional singing in a country church, and you, and you can see a courting couple in the upper left and uh, off in the cemetery or going down to the spring, as people used to do. Um, there's a guy on the upper right that you see the tents and the mules tied up, and he's dowsing for water because an earlier convention they drained the well three times in a three-day convention. And uh, you can see the dinner tables being set up here. So I just wanted to point out what you can see in this very special work of art by Beth Ann Hill. And thank you very much. All right, everyone, thank you for, thank you, Dr. Steele, and thank you, everyone, for attending. We do have some time for a few questions. Yeah. If you have any questions, we just ask that you use the microphone, so give us a second to get to you. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. When did I first 
when did you first, when were you first exposed to sacred music? Yes, uh, I had discovered some of the songbooks in the, in high school in the 1960s, but 1972 is when I first went to Sacred Harp singing, uh, both in, in Boston and also in Clay County, Alabama. <laughs> Coming back ever since. Yes, sir. Is there some relation between certain notes on the harp and this type of music? How did it, how did the harp get into it? Right. Okay. That's a that's a very good question. And I left out the fact that sacred harp singing is ordinarily not accompanied by harps or any other instrument, um, but uh, as a as a kind of symbol of sacred song, we associate with King David. And so there are a lot of songbooks that are named after musical instruments, especially the psaltery, the lyre, but sometimes even the trumpet and other instruments. And so a lot of singers today would tell you that the sacred harp is their own vocal chords. Mm -hmm. really? Yes? In doing some genealogy work for my family, I discovered that some of my early relatives had, had written songs mm -hmm. for the Sacred Heart of previous publications. But I can't seem to, I don't know exact titles, I just have their names, the names of my family. How might I research that more to discover more about that? You say they, they're, the songs, uh, you know their names, though. Yes, not and, the names of the songs, the names of my relatives. Yes. And I have uh -huh. and this information was handed down yeah. in, in an old Bible. Uh -huh. Well, if, you, if they're definitely printed in earlier editions of the Sacred Harp, you could go to a library um, or the Sacred Harp Museum in Carrollton, Georgia, or uh, other libraries like Emory University, um, and, and try to find those songs page by page. Look for their names on that song. I've Googled, I've Googled, yeah. the, the normal thing when I see songs. And um, there is a, a, a study being done right now uh, by a man in Texas of the, the Cooper, revised Cooper edition, the, that blue book, which has several old sacred harp songs that are not in the red book. And so he's doing, he's researching those right now. Thank you. Yeah. Robert L. Vaughn. Yes. Yeah, sir, do you have any recommendations on CDs, recordings that might be good? Especially, I'm, I'm interested in people with, with good vocal sound. Um. Um, yes, well, there are, there are some, uh, I think they're published by the Alabama Folklore Association, or the yeah, Folklife Association, Folk Life Association. Um, quite good ones, as, uh, and um, particularly ones from Liberty Church in um, Henniger, Alabama, and that it's um, they were the basis of the singers who sang in the movie Cold Mountain, although there, a lot of others joined in with them. But they do have uh, they they have uh, high quality singing that you'd probably enjoy. <laughs> but they're uh, like I say, they're all these regional traditions as well. Yes. I noticed that Amazon has six paperback books of the of this for $23.81. Has anybody gotten put any of these books on, on uh, the electronic uh, digital books? Well, parts of this book are on Google Books already. Parts of this book are on Google Books. And uh, I don't know if the University of Illinois Press also has it as a Kindle or something like that. But well, you... you we, we do have copies in the in the lobby. It's for it's for sale here. Yeah, there are copies yeah. in the lobby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can you can get them for you can get used copies for a very little. <laughs> Probably new ones as well. Yes. Um, I, I was curious, um, how were they able to successfully distribute this interdenominationally? How did they get this all over the place? This was done by singing teachers who used them in singing schools because it was to the advantage of churches of several denominations to have good singing in their church. 
people that knew how to sing and knew how to read music. And so the singing schools and the singing teachers uh, are how the books mostly got, people bought them from their singing teacher. Warren. Yes. Uh, we, I know we have at least a couple of composers uh, in the room. Would you talk a little bit about contemporary writers of Sacred Harp music? Uh, yes. He's, well, you saw, um, I mentioned uh, uh, like Hugh McGraw and members of the Denson family, but the, there are many composers who are, are from uh, families who have sung for several generations, but there are also songs in the book by um, in, in this uh, in both the blue book and the red book, songs written by people from outside the South who came to Sacred Harp singing as an adult uh, as an adult and um, now there's also a um, an online periodical called the Trumpet which is all new Sacred Harp style music by contemporary composers, some of them even from Europe, that's available free on the internet. It's from a site called singthetrumpet.org. Yes. Um, I thought I would like to offer a couple of uh, shameless plugs. Uh -huh. we, sing, we sing twice a year in Montgomery Yes. And then the next occasion will be at Old Alabama Town on the third Thursday of July. We'll sing from 9.30 until 2.30 with a, with a break for lunch. And you would all be welcome to join us. And we're likely to shove a book in your hand and uh, encourage you to take part because it's participatory as much it is, as it is to be heard. So yeah. we'd love to have you join us. The second plug is that there's a, a website called fasola.org and it has the schedule for Alabama and all of the United States on when singings mm -hmm. will be held and where you can go to attend a singing so it so they're free and open to the public and we'd love to have anybody join us to yeah. sing the, and the other Montgomery singing right is right here in this building it is on the first in February first Saturday of February yes, yes. thank you yeah Okay, I think we're out of time for the general session, but if anyone has any questions or has a book they would like to have signed, feel free to come up and talk to Dr. Steele. Thank you again for a wonderful program, and thank you very much. Okay, thank you.